Google mm-hmm. announced with their work in uh, the the paper in Nature with quantum supremacy. Yes. Can you describe again back to the basic? What is perhaps not so basic? What is quantum supremacy? Absolutely. So uh, quantum supremacy is a term that was coined by again by John Preskill in uh, 2012. Uh, not not everyone likes the name, you know, but uh, uh, you know we, it 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 it's sort of stuck. Uh, uh, you know, we don't. Uh, and, uh, we sort of haven't found a better alternative. It's technically, uh, you know, and, quantum computational. Com- uh, yeah, supremacy. yeah, supremacy. That's right. That's right. And but but the basic idea is actually one that goes all the way back to the beginnings of quantum computing when uh, Richard Feynman and David Deutsch, people like that, were talking about it in the early eighties. And and uh, and and quantum supremacy just refers to sort of the point in history when you can first use a quantum computer to do some well-defined task uh, much faster than any known algorithm running on any of the classical computers that are available. Okay, so uh, you know, notice that I did not say a useful task. Yes. Okay, you know, it could be something completely artificial. But it's important that the task be well defined. So, in other words, you know, there is it, it is something that has right and wrong answers, you know, and th- that are knowable independently of this device, right? And we can then, you know, run the device, see if it gets the right answer or not. Can you clarify yeah. a small point? You said much faster than a classical implementation. Yeah. Uh, what about? Sort of. What about the space with where the class? There's no. There's not. It doesn't even exist a classical algorithm oh, to so, solve the so, problem. So, so, so maybe I should clarify. Everything that a quantum computer can do, a classical computer can also eventually do. Okay, and the reason why we know that is that uh, uh, a classical computer could always, you know, if it had no limits of time and memory, it could always just store the entire quantum state you know, of your, you know, of, of the mm-hmm. quantum, right, store in, a list of all the amplitudes, you know, in, in, in the state of the quantum computer, and then just, you know, do some linear algebra to just update that state, right? And so, so anything that quantum computers can do can also be done by classical computers, albeit exponentially slower in so some cases. quantum computers don't go into some magical place outside of Alan Turing's they definition of computation. Precisely. They do not solve the halting problem. Right. They cannot solve anything that is uncomputable in Alan Turing's sense. What they, what we think they do change is what is efficiently computable. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, since the 1960s, you know, the word efficiently, you know, as well has been a central word in computer science, but it's sort of a code word for something technical, which is uh, basically with polynomial scaling, Mm -hmm. you know, that as you get to larger and larger inputs, you would like an algorithm that uses an amount of time that scales only like the size of the input raised to some power and not exponentially with the size of the input, right? Yeah, so I I do hope we get to talk again because Mm. one of the many topics that there's probably several hours worth of conversation Mm. on is complexity, which we probably won't even get a chance to touch (laughs) Mm. today. But uh, you briefly mentioned it. Uh But let's uh, let's maybe try to continue. So you said uh, the definition of quantum supremacy is basically uh, design is achieving a place where much faster on a formal mm-hmm. that quantum computer is much faster on a formal well defined problem yes. that's not that is or isn't useful yeah 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 right right and and I, I would say that we really want three things right we want first of all the quantum computer to be much faster just in the literal sense of like number of seconds you know uh, it's a solving this you know well defined you know, problem. Secondly, we want it to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, for a problem where we really believe that a quantum computer has better scaling behavior, right? So it's not just an incidental, you know, matter of hardware, but it's that, you know, as you went to larger and larger inputs, you know, the classical scaling would be exponential and the scaling for, for the quantum algorithm would only be polynomial. And then thirdly, we want the first thing, the actual observed speed up, to only be explainable in terms of the scaling behavior, right? So, you know, I want, I want you know, a, a real world, you know, a real problem to get solved. 
uh, let's say by a quantum computer with 50 qubits mm -hmm. or so, and for no one to be able to explain that in any way other than, well, you know, the, to uh, the, uh, this, this computer involved a quantum state with two to the 50th power amplitudes. And, you know, a classical simulation, at least any that we know today, would require keeping track of two to the 50th numbers. And this is the reason why it was faster. So the intuition is that yeah. then if you demonstrate uh, on 50 qubits, then once you get to 100 qubits, then it'll be even much more faster. Precisely, right. precisely. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and, and quantum supremacy does not require error correction, right? We don't, you know, we don't have, you could say, true scalability yet, or true, you know, uh, 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 error correction yet. But you could say quantum supremacy is already enough by itself to refute the skeptics who said a quantum computer will never outperform a classical computer for anything. But... One, how do you demonstrate quantum yeah. supremacy? And two, what's up with these new news articles I'm reading that Google did so? Yeah, all right, well- uh, What did uh, they great, actually do? Great, great questions, because now you get into uh, uh, actually, you know, a lot of the work that I've, you know, I and my students have been doing for the last decade, which was precisely about uh, uh, how do you demonstrate quantum supremacy using technologies that you know we thought would be available in the near future? And so um, one of the main things that uh, we realized in around 2011, and this was um, me and my student uh, Alex Arkhipov at, at MIT at the time, and uh, independently uh, some um, um, others, including uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard. Okay, and uh, the the realization that, that that we came to was that if you just want to prove that a quantum computer is faster, you know, and not do something useful with it, mm -hmm. then there are huge advantages to sort of switching your attention from problems like factoring numbers that have a single right answer to uh, what we call sampling problems. So these are problems where the goal is just to output a sample from some probability distribution, let's say over strings of 50 bits, right? So there are you know many, many, many possible valid outputs. You know your computer will probably never even produce the same output twice. You know, if it's running as as uh, 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 even you know, assuming it's running perfectly, okay. But but the key is that some outputs are supposed to be likelier than other ones. So, so sorry to, yeah. to to clarify, is there a set of outputs that are valid and set they're not, or is it it's, more that the distribution mm -hmm. of a particular kind of output is more is like there's yeah. a specific distribution of yeah. a particular there's kinds a, there's, of there's 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 a specific distribution that you're trying to hit right or you know that you're trying to sample from now there are a lot of questions about this you know how do you do that right now now how you how how you do it you know it turns out that with a quantum computer even with the noisy quantum computers that we have now that we have today what you can do is basically just apply a randomly chosen sequence of operations mm -hmm. right so we you know we in some of you know we you know that part is almost trivial right we just sort of get the qubits to interact in some random way although a sort of precisely specified random way so we can repeat the exact same random sequence of interactions again and get another sample from that same distribution and what this does is it basically well it creates a lot of garbage but you know very specific garbage right so you know so, uh, of all of the uh so if we're going to talk about google's device there were 53 qubits there okay and so there are two to the 53 power possible outputs mm -hmm. now for some of those outputs you know there are um there was a little bit more destructive interference in their amplitude okay so their amplitudes were a little bit smaller and for others there was a little more constructive interference you know the amplitudes were a little bit more aligned with each other you know the and so those those that were a little bit likelier okay mm -hmm. all of the outputs are exponentially unlikely but some are let's say two times or three times you know unlikelier than others okay right. and uh, so so you can define you know this sequence of operations that gives rise to this probability distribution okay now um, the next question would be well how do you you know even if you're sampling from it how do you verify that right, right? how do you, exactly. how do you know and so um, my students and I and also the uh, people at Google who are doing the experiment came up with 
statistical tests that you can apply to the outputs uh, in order to uh, uh, um, try to verify, you know, what is, you know, that that uh, that uh, at least that some hard problem is being solved. Uh, the the test that Google ended up using uh, was something that they called the linear cross entropy benchmark. Okay, and it's basically, you know, so the the, the drawback of this test is that it requires like it requires you to do a two to the 53 time c calculation with your classical computer. Okay, so, it, so it's very expensive oh. <laughs> to do the test on a classical yeah. computer. The good news How is- How big of a number is two to the 53? It's about nine quadrillion. Okay. That doesn't help. Well, well, you know, it's uh, you, you want <laughs> no, it I mean, in like scientific notation. No, no, no. I mean, no. A, what I mean is, yeah, uh, it is, it is, uh, it is impossible just, to run on a. Yeah, computer. so we will come back yeah. to that. It is yeah. just barely possible to run. We think on the largest supercomputer that currently exists on Earth, Correct. which is called Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this the, is that's exciting. The, that's the that's the short answer. So so I, I ironically for this type of experiment, we don't want a hundred qubits. Okay, mm -hmm. because with a hundred qubits, even if it works, we don't know how to verify the results. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want, you know, a number of qubits that is enough that, you know, the biggest classical computers on earth will have to sweat, you know, and we'll just barely, you know, be able to keep up with, with the quantum computer, you know, using much more time, but they will still be able to do it in order that we can verify the results. Which result. is where the 53 comes from for the Basically, number Basically, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's also, that's sort of, you know, the, the mo I mean, that's 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 sort of where they are now in yeah. terms of scaling, you know, and then, you know, soon, you know, that point will be passed. And and then when you get to larger numbers of qubits, then you know these these types of sampling experiments will no longer be so interesting because we we won't even be able to verify the results and we'll have to switch to other types of computation. So with it with the sampling thing, you know, so so the test that Google applied with this linear cross entropy benchmark was basically just take the samples that were generated, mm -hmm. which are you know a sm very small subset of all the possible samples that there are, but for those you calculate with your classical computer the probabilities that they should have been output. Mm -hmm. And you see, are those probabilities like larger than the mean? You know, mm -hmm. so is the quantum computer biased toward outputting the, the strings that it's, you know, that, that you want it to be biased toward? Okay, and then finally we come to a very crucial question, which is supposing that it does that. Well, how do we know that a classical computer could not have quickly done the same thing, right? How do we know that, you know, this couldn't have been spoofed by a classical computer? Right. And so, uh, well, the, the first answer is we don't know for sure, because, you know, this takes us into questions of complexity theory. Right. You know, uh, you know, the I mean, questions on the of the magnitude of the P versus NP question and things but, like that. Right. We you know, we don't know how to rule out uh, definitively that there could be fast classical algorithms for, you know, even simulating quantum mechanics and uh, for, you know, simulating experiments like these. But we can give some evidence against that possibility. And that was sort of the, you know, the main thrust of a lot of the work that my colleagues and I did, you know, over the last decade, which is then sort of in around 2015 or so, what led to Google deciding to do this experiment. So are, is the kind of evidence here, first of all, the hard P equals NP problem that you mentioned mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. kind of uh, evidence that you're, uh, were looking at, is that something you come to on a sheet of paper? Or is this something? Are these yeah. empirical experiments? It's it's math for the most part. I mean, it, it, you know, it's also tr tr you know you know we have uh, a bunch of uh, methods that are known for simulating quantum uh, uh, circuits or you know quantum computations with classical computers, and so we have to try them all out and make sure that you know they don't work. You know, right. make sure that they have exponential scaling on 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 you know these problems and and not just theoretically, but with the actual range of parameters that are actually you know uh, uh, arising in Google's experiment. Okay, so so there is an empirical component to it, right? But now um, on uh, on on the theoretical side, you know what. Basically, what we know how to do in theoretical computer science and computational complexity is, you know, we don't know how to prove that most of the problems we care about are hard, but we know how to pass the blame to someone else. Okay, we know <laughs> right. how to say, well, look, you know, I can't prove that this problem is hard, 
But if it is easy, then all these other things that, you know, mm-hmm. you know, for sure, you, know, you probably were, were much more confident or were, were hard, then those, then those would be easy as well. Okay. So, so we can give what are called reductions. And this has been the basic strategy in, you know, N- NP completeness, right? In, in all of theoretical computer science and cryptography since the 1970s, really. And so we were able to give some reduction evidence for the hardness of simulating these um, um, sampling experiments, these sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments. The reduction evidence is not as satisfactory as it should be. One of the biggest open problems in this area is to make it better. But, you know, we can do something. You know, certainly we can say that, you know, if there is a fast classical algorithm to spoof these experiments, then it has to be very, very unlike any of the algorithms that we know. Which is kind of in the same kind of space of reasoning that people say P equal not equals NP. Yeah, it's, 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 it's in the same spirit. 